Okay, so I want to start by giving um, a little bit of context um, for what I'll be talking about. Uh, you've, you've probably noticed uh, both in presentations, presentations today and also uh, in maternal writing, both in art and otherwise, that there's often personal narrative or some context given maybe for why, why or how that person came to a maternal topic. Um, so I want to give a little bit of that uh, today, sharing about how I came to this. Uh, so I was trained first as a printmaker uh, when I decided to go to graduate school for a PhD in art history. Uh, I made the decision to sort of give up printmaking for the time, to give up making uh, for that period. And to, it, grad school is a very intense time, obviously, in, in any field. And so trying to de dedicate my focus to, to that uh, to the thinking and writing at that point. Um, and then also during that time, uh, we started a family, and also a very intense thing. So uh, between the, the school and the mothering, um, not making at all. Um, but after about 10 years, uh, after the birth of my third child, I felt like it was time to start making um, again when, when there had felt like there was no time. And I, sort of as an aside, I will say it's not just and I'm sure you know this, it's not just in, in art that motherhood is not well-received in, uh, in the academy as well, which is a whole other topic uh, in my art history program. There was very little space for that discussion. Um, our department chair, who was a very well-known scholar, uh, sort of famously now uh, among many of us who were there at the time, uh, upon finding out that one of his students was expecting, uh, said dismissively, well, I'll stop expecting to see her dissertation chapters, just that this was... Completely, right, completely writing her off because of that. So, um, so when I went back to sort of studio practice, uh, this was one of the first projects. Uh, it was called the Food Landscape, and uh, it was made well. It was very much in the thick of mothering and breastfeeding. Uh, the Food Landscape was a conceptual project that marked the end of my breastfeeding journey, uh, and it showed a gradual ten-month-long transition from the time that my youngest was exclusively breastfeeding through that transition to solid foods, from the time that she began solid foods to uh, completely weaning. So it was about a 10-month period. Uh, I made a print for each day of that transition, um, made, each one made from the foods that she was eating on that particular day. Um, and I, had, I was also doing a lot of drawing at that point, um, mostly while she was nursing, because that's when she was still. I could capture something. Uh, and so the, the curvature of the line on, uh, on the right side is sort of the curvature of her mouth as she was uh, nursing. So uh, some of the colors at the time were rather vibrant, so whether they were blueberries or peas would give uh, some pretty bold food-based um, ink colors. But uh, many of them were much more neutral. This is one of the brighter ones. Many of them were more yellows, browns. Uh, and I know that over time already, those colors are fugitive and starting to, to fade. So, um, you know, sort of a... Interesting thing to think about that it was a very transitional time for me, and these prints too will be sort of transitional in the way that they remain or, or yeah, no longer sort of exist after a while. Um, around the same time, um, because of the art historical background, also seeking out other artist mothers or finding out you know what's being written in you know, all the studies of 70s feminism and beyond that I was doing during graduate school. No surprise, not a lot happening, or other than Mary Kelly, not a lot that we had read about around mothers. So trying to seek out, you know, what else is going on, who's writing about this, I have really interest, interest in collaborations. So I started a project that turned into this book, Reconciling Art and Mothering, um, that was really rewarding. It was a series of it's a, 25 essays by both artists and art, art historians, trying to bring those voices together in a way that doesn't always happen. We don't always want to hear from each other in those ways. Um, and it's, I brought this copy for Deirdre, but I will pass it around for anybody who wants to see it. Um, it's fascinating to me now to think about that. That was published three years ago. And I think at that time, I did not know a single one of you here. <laughs> and it felt like it was a very, not comprehensive, but it felt like a, a, a wide spectrum um, of voices because they represent six continents, although it's heavily North American. Um, and yet, if we were doing this project today, it would look so different because simply because of this great... Uh, sort of not a, not a resurgence, but a, an upstart or a, a critical mass of conversation happening, like we've seen in so many areas. Uh, so I've I've been continue I've continued to be interested in finding ways to develop intersections between what's happening in my personal life and what's happening in my professional life, uh, and I'm always drawn to work that engages with political and social issues. So that leads me into um, what I'm talking about today. Uh, 
looking at the work of three artists who address the censorship of the lactating body. So now on to that. So media coverage from uh, the United States in the last several years uh, reports on a weekly, if not, uh, well, weekly or, or at least monthly basis, uh, instances of discrimination and censorship around breastfeeding. Breastfeeding mothers have been denied their legal rights in workplaces, restaurants, health clubs, airplanes, swimming pools, retail stores, and courtrooms. While nearly all of the 50 United States now have laws that specifically allow breastfeeding in public, the vast majority have no enforcement provisions, meaning that breastfeeding mothers may have little legal recourse when their actions are censored. Popular magazines and newspapers, of course, report on such incidents, and some even manufacture their own controversies, such as this that you may have well have seen uh, in May of 2013, Jamie Lynn Grummet agreed to participate in a photo shoot about breastfeeding for Time Magazine. Grummet later shared that the photographer, disregarding hundreds of usable photographs, staged this awkward scene after several hours of work when her son was exhausted. The standing pose has the effect of making her son look taller and older than his four years, particularly since Grummet is a quite petite woman. And of course, it generated a firestorm of controversy in the US about breastfeeding in letters to the editor and online. In a time when controversies about mothering blow up over social media, mothers who might never claim the label of activist are unexpectedly becoming so, using social media to their own ends. In March of this year, for instance, new mom Kristen Hilderman was shamed by a United Airlines flight attendant for breastfeeding her five-month-old son in flight. She complained to United Airlines and received little response until she turned to Twitter, where her story was retweeted nearly 2,500 times, prompting an eventual apology from the airline. Two years after their manufactured controversy, Time magazine this spring published an article about Hilderman suggesting that social media is helping moms win the war over breastfeeding. Also this year, celebrities and, and everyday women, both in the U.S. and elsewhere, have joined the Free the Nipple campaign with actions of guerrilla nudity designed to challenge the censorship not only of breastfeeding but of women's bodies in general. So in this context, it's perhaps unsurprising that recent years have also witnessed a groundswell of maternal activism among North American artists, some of whom directly engage as agents of change around breastfeeding. By employing collaboration, intervening in institutional spaces and moving outside of them, and creating works that actively oppose social treatment of the breastfeeding body, these artists raise questions and alter spaces in ways that make it visible and challenge one of the taboos still surrounding motherhood. In order to destabilize the perceived spectacle of the breastfeeding body, each of these artist activists stages a spectacle of her own, confronting public discomfort while placing the breastfeeding body front and center. U.S. artist Jill Miller, who many of you know, conceived a performative response to the unfriendly environment encountered by many U.S. mothers who nurse in public. After raising funds through a Kickstarter campaign in 2011, Miller purchased an old ice cream truck and converted it into a breastfeeding support vehicle. She envisioned that she would drive the truck around Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, offering support to nursing mothers, attending nursing-related events, and responding to breastfeeding emergencies. The milk truck, a lactivist mobile art installation and performance, empowers nursing mothers, creates community, and raises awareness. And as a truck topped by a five-foot breast with a flashing nipple is a sight to behold. So two things, I think, make Miller's activism particularly effective, her social and civic engagement and her use of humor. Initial drawings from the Kickstarter video point to Miller's idealistic vision for the truck as a comfortable place where mothers from different walks of life might come together to support each other through breastfeeding. Miller took her project to the streets, driving the truck around Pittsburgh and bringing heightened visibility to breastfeeding. This mobile restaurant made its debut at the 2011 Pittsburgh Biennial, and September 12 of that year was declared the Milk Truck Day by the City Council. By moving outside of the museum, Miller inserted the milk truck into public and civic discourse, intervening in a pointed, if humorous way. Instances of breastfeeding censorship are by nature tense encounters. By introducing an oversized, unexpected, ridiculous emergency vehicle, Miller immediately diffused the situation and disarmed potentially critical viewers. 
Hyperbolizing the idea of spectacle, Miller took the focus off of the publicly debated breastfeeding body and put it squarely on the shoulders of the truck. As Miller said, thought the nursing mother created a spectacle, meet the milk truck. Through its very presence, the milk truck opens up spaces for critical discourse and community connections. Drawing viewers in with a spectacle of the truck, Miller offered up a space for conversation and the potential for some eventual common ground. Just Dobkin, an American artist living in Toronto, similarly used spectacle to enable a public discussion of breastfeeding. And while I, of course, realize that Toronto is not in the U.S., I suggest that, that her background uh, in the U.S. informs the context of her work. In a piece performed between 2006 and 2012 entitled The Lactation Station Breast Milk Bar, Dobkin staged gallery events akin to wine tastings. Using breast milk donated by six lactating mothers, Dobkin acted for the evening as a sommelier of sorts, leading participants through breast milk tastings and discussing with them the flavor differences between the milks, the nutty flavors or hints of curry, and at the same time making space for expressions of awkwardness and uneasiness. By addressing the social discomfort around the concept of milk tasting, Dobkin's performance implicitly confronted the larger issue of discomfort with breastfeeding in general. At the same time, she turned the tables on the female body that is so prominent in galleries and museums. Intervening in an institutional space, Dobkin introduced the product of women's breasts into the gallery and opened it up as a place for honest critical discourse rather than as a space for simply viewing the nude female form. In the promotional poster for the event, however, Dobkin used her own nude body to add to the spectacle. Although Dobkin used breast milk donated by other mothers, she here advertised the event in a way that, like Miller, exaggerates the potential controversy. As many mothers will know from experience, expressing milk most often involves a sizable machine to pump the breast milk. By manipulating the image to appear that she effortlessly shoots milk into wine glasses, Dobkin humorously engaged with social perceptions in a number of ways, first by suggesting that perhaps many people do not actually know what is involved with pumping breast milk, second by implicitly acknowledging that the nude white female body is used to advertise many things, whether or not that body has anything to do with the product, or in this case, the milk. And lastly, and what is more of an inside joke with herself, by exaggerating her own body's abilities, as Dobkin herself had an unsuccessful breastfeeding relationship with her child. In a significantly different way, uh, Chicago photographer Ashley Wells Jackson embraces and showcases the spectacle of postpartum and lactating bodies. Since 2013, Jackson has been traveling the world to photograph women for the Fourth Trimester Bodies Project. Conceived as Jackson sought, to re sought ways to recover from infant loss and from traumatic birth experiences, Fourth Trimester Bodies has both general and specific goals to honor and make visible the vast array of women's postpartum bodies and to use these photo sessions as a means to highlight women's choices and varied experiences in birth, breastfeeding, and mothering. For some, the photos are pure celebration. For others, including Jackson herself, they're the first step in a long journey of healing. A few days ago, uh, Griselda Pollock observed that, um, that some artists feel, I think she called it, uh, the need to bear witness uh, to maternal experience, and that's certainly the case for Jackson. She begins first and foremost uh, seeking validation and visibility for varied maternal experiences rather than beginning from any kind of theoretical uh, context. In Jackson's photos, some others are shown breastfeeding or surrounded by their children. Others are photographed in multi-generational groups. Still others are photographed alone. The vast majority showcase bodies not found in magazines, whether for size or shape, age or ethnicity. Regardless of how much skin the photos show or don't show, however, Fourth Trimester Bodies has been routinely banned from U.S.-based social media sites, the point at which Jackson's project turned activist in nature. Last summer witnessed a particular onslaught of social media censorship. Although her photographs do not violate the community standards set forth by Facebook or Instagram, she was repeatedly locked out of her account, and her account was deleted nearly a dozen times, with many dozens of photographs removed, whether they included breastfeeding or nudity or not. Sometimes the deletions came with a warning, but often the photos were censored surreptitiously, removed without warning or explanation. Neither Facebook nor Instagram has responded to the hundreds of email contacts by Jackson and her attorneys. 
In response, Jackson initiated an activist campaign called Stop Censoring Motherhood, which she promotes on her social media accounts and at her many photo sessions and public presentations. As Jackson shared recently, sadly, we've started censoring our own photos for Instagram and Facebook with a black heart over the breasts. While fewer of her breastfeeding photos have recently been removed, she's found that a more insidious form of censorship is now taking place. The Fourth Trimester Bodies Project has over 50,000 Facebook followers, yet her posts no longer reach more than a tiny fraction of that audience, apparently throttled at the outset. If anything, though, the censorship of Jackson's project has convinced her more than ever of the need to normalize the wide variety of postpartum bodies and to normalize images and perceptions of breastfeeding, particularly in the United States. She has amped up her project at an almost viral pace, combating sensorial attitudes by inundating the Internet with thousands of images. In one of her most recent breastfeeding and feeding photos, Jackson montaged a sequence featuring nine women and herself with the goal of broadening what is considered socially acceptable for nursing behavior. So not only mothers with newborns, but also those with toddlers and preschoolers, mothers who pump exclusively, and mothers who use supplementary nursing systems. Jackson, Dobkin, and Miller each operate in the context of American cultural prohibitions surrounding breastfeeding that result in discriminatory emotional encounters. Elizabeth Podniex, a social scientist, argues that the censorship of breastfeeding is not isolated but represents a broader cultural attitude, saying mass media praises and vilifies mothers, keeping them under constant surveillance and judging them according to the extent to which they adhere to the ideologies of good motherhood. When nursing in public is deemed inappropriate or even obscene, breastfeeding mothers become bad mothers, despite the fact that pediatricians, lactation consultants, and even formula companies espouse that breast is best. By exaggerating the spectacle that often surrounds breastfeeding, Jackson, Miller, and Dobkin directly engage with conflicted cultural perceptions of their breastfeeding body. Using activist strategies of humor, repetition, location, and social engagement, each of these artists opens up spaces for dialogue that, we may hope, will normalize perceptions of the lactating postpartum body and help to change the public conversation. Thank you. Thank you.